is to be our. Uh, yeah, next week we expect to have John uh, Josh Gailey comparing the Gospel of the New Testament with what we find in the Book of Mormon. On August twenty three, we have one discovered sharing treasures in heaven. August thirty, Rainbow Eagle, that is Roland Williston, the brother of Ralph Williston, who shared with us a couple of times, will bring us the spiritual visitor tradition and the teaching of the peace shield. On September 6, Paul and Dee Ludi will be sharing their Book of Mormon resources for adults and children. September 13, David Reed returns to give us a look at three of the lesser known American cities of the Book of Mormon period. And then September 20 will be our next review of the previous eight presentations. And so with that, uh, if I can get the uh, I have a, I have a PowerPoint that I would like to share, and I would like to be able to share everything with you as usual. But because of my computer problems, I've not been successful at getting um, my computer to cooperate to get me onto Zoom tonight. I'm having to use my my little machine, and right now I'm not certain I even got that working right because it tells me that. The meeting is being recorded. I guess that's it. Um, and I'm getting to watch the little, the pretty little colorful ball roll across my screen where I'd like to be able to to share the prayer that I had composed. But since I can't uh, get the prayer to come up either, it's exasperating when the machine doesn't work and our, our plans uh, um, get so promptly modified. But uh, let me uh, let me ask you to continue to be patient with me. I've been having to be patient with the machine, and and uh, my dad pointed out that that if you've got enough faith, it'll it'll get you there. And so this evening, I need to invite you to join your faith with us, so that we can uh, share about the nature of truth. And I have the screen uh, such that I wait. Maybe if I move that over and get the magnifier on it. Nope, that doesn't work either. Boy. Well, I'm constrained by a machine that isn't cooperating with me tonight. So let's uh, let's bow for a word of prayer. Creating Father, the Alpha and Omega, who is the master of all that we see, beautiful weather, the hummingbirds, the flowers, and we recognize all of eternity. We appreciate tonight that as we gather to discuss the nature of truth, that there is a great deal that we need to learn, yet there's a great deal that we have to share. And so we pray that you would help us to share and be able to listen to each other and to appreciate the vantage points that we have uh, in our midst to, uh, to gain insight into the nature of the truth that you are and the one that we would like to be able to honor you by. It is our preference to be able to discuss and share kindly and uh, appreciatively of each other. And so we ask for you to, for your blessing to help us have patience and to be considerate of, of each other as we talk about this very difficult topic, which is so broad and so narrow, so pervasive and so much like you. We ask for your blessing to help us. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. All right. I wanted to begin this evening with uh, an open file, open forum discussion on the uh, question that and my computer just went black again so here's a <laughs> for me the frustration about having my my uh, powerpoint pattern to work from is uh, a little annoying but to begin with i wanted us to to consider thomas jefferson's uh, point because in his declaration of independence he said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and I raised the question because I think there's a serious question about what truths are self-evident. So with an open forum, let's begin there, if you would, please. 
tell me what truths are self-evident is the truth that he identifies immediately thereafter that all men are created equal is that self-evident to you and is it even true what do you think floor is open you're welcome to unmute and uh, and jump in i'm not in position to be able to see the gallery and so we'll try to be patient with each other as we yell or perhaps uh, uh, Deb and Robert can see the gallery and and guide the discussion. Well, he obviously thought it wasn't true enough to practice it himself. To the contrary, I think he may well have. Nope. He was a slave owner until he died. Well, my understanding is that he was against slavery and wanted to free slaves, but he got messed up in being very far in debt and it never happened. He would spend all this money by building Monticello and all that kind of stuff. And he, anyway, let's say he planned to free all these slaves before he died and it did not happen. I'm not sure that disqualifies it being a self evident <laughs> truth. <laughs> I'm just saying that the man didn't even practice these self-evident truths himself. Well, it may be that equal is the wrong word here. It may be that we ought to be considering that which is equitable. But on the other hand, I, I see what Thomas Jefferson said as being fundamental scripture, basically, in terms of American history. What other, what other, what other truths that are um, like Am that that, that that you can cite? Yes, jump in. Paul, can you hear me? Yes. Who is that? Yes, Ed. We can hear you. That's Edward Fonce. Oh. Yeah. Ed Fonce. Um, good. Good evening. Welcome. First of all, I want to show you a book. Um, it's called The Majesty of God's Law. It's written by W. Cleon Schuster. This is, if you've never seen this book, this is an exhaustive review of all the resources that were available to the founders of the country at the time uh, that they wrote our national scriptures. And a lot of the, uh, the, the whole story about Thomas Jefferson and his slave ownership and what he wanted to do about it is, is uh, covered in this book. But Thomas Jefferson believed that uh, the principles of good government were laid down uh, in the Old Testament by Moses. Uh, John Adams argued uh, vehemently to find a way to go from a theocracy, which is what Moses had, the, the direct, um, the direction of the government by God through his prophets, uh, to a democratic republic. And it was, it was John Adams' work that relied primarily on uh, Montesquieu, who pointed out that the best way to do that was to convert the theocracy into a government of separated powers with uh, checks and balances on them, which is what they did. Um, Jefferson uh, was thoroughly um, he was thoroughly uh, impressed with the principles uh, that were laid down in, in uh, the government, not only of the ancient Israelites, but he pointed out that the Anglo-Saxons had a form of government that was nearly identical. Um, so I think when he referred to uh, these truths being self-evident, they were self-evident because they were deists. They were they were uh, believers in God and uh, in uh, Christ, and that's why it was self-evident to them. And 
to um, Mr. Scarborough's comment that that uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, was a slave owner. Uh, I think he released his slaves when he died. Uh, it's one thing to know what the self-evident truths are. It's another thing to uh, live them. Uh, just because he didn't free the slaves sooner, uh, doesn't mean he wasn't aware of the truths that were self-evident. Anyway, uh, if you haven't seen this book, uh, I highly recommend it to you. Uh, it is the most exhaustive analysis of the foundation of this country from a perspective of the uh, biblical scriptures. They may have been self-evident, but they weren't evident to everybody, apparently. That's right. That's not the but the Declaration of Independence was debated for two days after uh, Jefferson presented the, the document, and there was no there was no controversy, as I understand it, among the Second Continental Congress um, as to that language about the, um, the self-evident truths that he identified. They were all on board for that. As I understand the history of that time, only white men were allowed to vote. Only white men were involved in the setting up the Congress. Only white men were involved in the government. So when we see all men are created equal, we tend to interpret in our times where we generalize men to be human. Are you sure that that's what Jefferson intended? Well, another person. Well, if I could just chime in real quick, I think that Thomas Jefferson um, was a very complicated person. Um, he was a very contradictory person, but I, I love him. I, I consider myself kind of a Jeffersonian and and how I view um, yeah. the role of government and stuff like that. But um, you know, I, I think too is that you know. Um, Part of it was is trying to find a language in the Constitution that wasn't so like Benjamin Franklin went to um, Jefferson and said some of his initial uh, when he was coming up with different proposals for the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin said, you don't make this too, too much like it's sounding like it's coming from the pulpit. Uh, I think he actually was going to be a little bit more about like natural rights or something. And then he made it self-evident. So it was kind of the term that he came up with. Um, so it's just, a, there's this like this tension that's going on between secularism and also the fact that, you know, many of the people were believed in God. Now, of course, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He created the Jefferson Bible, uh, which is the most interesting thing because you have this Bible that he created in which he cut out all the miraculous aspects of the, of the New Testament and basically made the uh, New Testament into an ethical uh, document as opposed to a spiritual one. Ironically, even though we had this thing called separation of church and state today, it was the US Congress that actually printed that Bible. <laughs> so it's just a very fascinating uh, history about Thomas Jefferson. But just to get to the nature of truth, um, when we look at truth with a capital T, I tend to think that it can only in one sense apply to God. I think because we are flawed in our fallen state, um, and Paul tells us that we see through a glass darkly. So I feel like um, because we look, see through a glass darkly, it's hard for us, we shouldn't be so black and white in our views, that we should be open to different ideas and different opinions and be more subjective in how we see the world. Um, as we're moving into a postmodern society, I think uh, a subjectivity when it comes to the truth can be useful in trying to find a way to uh, navigate ourselves in this new world because the world is different than it has than it was just even 20 years ago. So I think if we look at God is T, the truth with the capital T, and then we have a subjective relationship with God. If you were to ask anybody about God and Jesus and their relationship, almost everybody has a different view of him. So it can't be like consistently all the same. So we just have to allow a lot of liberty as Christians 
that people are going to have different opinions. So our, uh, we can't be saying like, we have the truth, period, end of, end of conversation, because that's what causes wars, that's what causes conflict, rather than uh, truth, uh, lowercase, and also understand that that person on the other side that I might have disagreements with might also have some truth as well to say. Well, I find that that leads that that kind of a, a, a approach, however, tends to uh, give people when they're arguing about things, they'll say, "Well, that may not be true for you, but that's true for me, and everyone's entitled to their own truth." That's actually not that's not the case. Um, the problem we have with truth, the epistemological problem, is we can never get on the other side of our senses to know what's really out there. Uh, what we feel, smell, I mean, take all your senses, reasoning, intelligence, right? it's still dependent upon your input. So the question is, how can you ever know what's really out there if you are bounded by your senses? And I think the answer to that was given to Joseph Smith in section 90, when the definition, the scriptural definition of truth was laid down. And uh, if you want me to tell you what uh, I think it says is that in section 90, paragraph 4b, it says truth is knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they are to come. That actually is sort of the center point of the chiastic arrangement uh, regarding truth uh, in that section. It's a powerful, powerful statement because that's really what uh, scientists, for example, say that they're trying to think God's thoughts after him. They're looking for order in the universe, which they can describe mathematically or systematically or however uh, the particular field of uh, science or endeavor uh, records the results of their studies. Um, they're looking for order. So if you want to find order, the first assumption you have to make is that the universe is ordered. And uh, you're on a on a quest to find it. And of course, in, in quantum mechanics, the big the big thing is that you cannot know you cannot know the position of a particle and its uh, velocity simultaneously. Um, so they they always qualify what they talk about. But this but this statement to uh, Joseph Smith from Lord. And the knowledge of things as they are, as they are, as they were, and as they are to come, doesn't allow for uh, that kind of subjective finagling. Well, the one thing. So, first of all, I'm an evangelical. Uh, so, um, but it, it does remind us that you know that he is the same uh, yesterday, today, and forever, and that's God, capital T, truth. And our response to God, you had also said we're limited by our senses and, all, and then, the, and then the, the fleshly bodies that we're in, the imperfect bodies that we're in, and we see through a glass darkly. So when I say, like, we can say that there is truth, but our response to it is always going to be a different, everybody's response is going to be different because we are all coming from it from a different angle. It's going to ultimately be subjective in the context of our relationship to the truth. It's just hard as once we as individuals say, I have the truth, capital T, that's where we often have a lot of the conflicts that we have. And I think we have to be more humble in our approach and say, I have a truth. And I'm not saying, you know, like I'm not a, a moral relativist where anything goes or anything like that. But I just think we should take a humble approach when it comes to the regards of truth claims. I think uh, there's a missing point that has been made. Uh, until 1968, having my position uh, a literary test for uh, people in order to vote 
it's uh, proven that even uh, persons of the MIT, Yale, and so on, and so on, uh, fail the test. This means that whites only could vote. So the complete uh, constitution of the USA and history of the USA as to 1968 was whites only. In 68, you, you had a big uh, revolt. You had the killing of uh, what the name of the preacher uh, that was uh, killed. And only thereafter, uh, colored per persons were allowed to, to vote because they had to take a literacy test. Uh, and that test was that ambiguous that anybody uh, could say, well, your answer is wrong because you read it in one way. So uh, that's major if you talk about truth. Uh, until 1968, it's only white persons who, who were allowed uh, to define that. So this is a this is a new concept. It's only for it's only 40 years since uh, non-blacks uh, were allowed to give their uh, opinion legally. I could uh, add something too. I think there's an interesting theme that's kind of emerging here, which is that uh, we have uh, we have two concepts. I think we're trying to talk about here with the same term. So there's there's uh, I'll borrow Steve's terminology real quick for consistency here. There's the capital T truth, um, which Steve equated with God, um, and that I think Edward also pointed out in the Doctrine and Covenants of things that are now as they were and as they will be. But I think there's uh, our best understanding of truth that is actually separable from that. I think that that's where the subjectivity enters in, even in the Doctrine and Covenants. And I think in Second Nephi, I, I know it's it's Nephi writing this, that uh, he would say that there are, there are things that the Lord expresses to people through their language and through their understanding because they lack the language and the understanding to grasp the, the concepts in and of themselves. So I think of like in, in the LDS church, it's Doctrine and Covenants 19. I don't know if the citation is different um, in each tradition, but uh, it's, it's uh, the concept of eternal damnation and uh, the term eternal damnation. Does that mean that it's never ending or what does this really mean? And the Lord says essentially that uh, I, I gave them this term because it had a, an effect on them, on the people that they would repent. It had this, uh, this it was a very heavy term to, to give them but it wasn't necessarily the, the reality in and of itself. It was just something that would help them to move toward repentance. So I think that there's these two concepts of the capital T, T objective truth, but our, our best understanding of it too. And I think that we can, we can honor the intimacy and subjectivity of trying to understand things for ourselves on this end, while also acknowledging that there are objective truths. I, I think for instance of um, relationships, like a romantic relationship, where um, maybe there was a, a, an act of infidelity, hypothetically speaking, your partner, you find that your partner cheated on you. And so you go from this, this moment where you're subjectively feeling very secure in your relationship, very happy with someone that you love and you believe loves you, um, to suddenly learning that this person has been with someone else without your knowledge or consent, you know, in an intimate and romantic way. And suddenly you're lost and you don't know where you are. It's, it's not to say that there's no objective truth there. The objective truth was that this partner was, you know, being unfaithful in this way. Um, but the subjective truth was that you lived in a completely different world prior to learning about that. So I think when we can separate the two of those things, I think it can clarify a lot of epistemological issues when we, when we kind of like what Edward said, though, that we can never get past our own senses. So we're, we're kind of hopelessly left to figure out objective truth through our own subjectivity. Hence what Steve is saying, which is that, uh, you know, we have so many different answers. And I think that's in large part because we only have so many senses and uh, so many um, capacities. I'd like to say something. Uh, I couldn't tell you which, re which revelation it is, but I'm relatively sure that in Doctrine and Covenants, 
uh, uh, put forth the forth the idea that God was working with the founding fathers. I'm quite sure that's in there, isn't it? I believe it is. He so says the con he said the Constitution yeah. was written by wise men whom he raised up to state yeah. the principle that all flesh was there to. Yeah. Well, I think these men like Jefferson and Washington both had slaves, but I think God still picked them to, uh, as people working in as her founding fathers, I believe God worked through both of them. I think Washington, for instance, was known to pray quite a lot. But then I'm just saying he's the perfect either, but I believe God was definitely working through him. In fact, there's some Indians that claim they know that God prevented his death earlier on. They were kept fighting, kept uh, shooting at him and he just wouldn't go down. So I, I personally believe that it is true that God protected him so he could be our first president and yeah. also uh, in charge of, of uh, the Revolutionary War. Well, I think that we're, we're talking about, I agree with uh, Nathan, that we have two different problems here. One is the question is, is there such a thing as T, uh, truth with a capital T? And is it knowable? But the second problem we have is how do we communicate among ourselves as humans? I know 50 years of arguing cases before the courts in California, um, I, I kind of threw up my hands at trying to uh, communicate the truth of the law to certain people. <laughs> um, so I, I, I thought uh, the topic as I read it was, uh, or it's first an epistemological problem. Is there such a thing as truth with a capital T? And I think there must be. Uh, how do we how do we make uh, allowances among our co communications as humans uh, for the fact that we see through a glass darkly and different levels of darkness? Um, but we have a hint in the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, in an earlier section of, um, of, of the, uh, I'm, I'm referring to the uh, RLDS or that version. In Doctrine and Covenants section six, paragraph seven A, it says, in talking to Joseph, behold, thou knowest that thou hast inquired of me, okay? He had, uh, he had experience of inquiring of the Lord and receiving an answer, of course, the uh, initial vision. And then the section goes on and says, and I did enlighten thy mind. And now I tell you these things that thou mayest know that thou has been enlightened by the spirit of truth. And many places in the Doctrine and Covenants, and especially in section 90, uh, the reference is made to... Uh, the Lord being our light and truth, and that he has all truth, that the Father shared with him all truth. So epistemologically, I say, yes, we're looking to find the capital T truth of the matters, but we have to always be gentle in talking with other people about not offending them by uh, um, arrogantly proposing that we've got, that we found it, and we got it. We wrote it down. Uh, so uh, there are those two problems. No question. Very well put. Blair, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, I would like to say that I have in front of me a copy of Doctrine and Covenants, an LDS version that marks the numbers of the RLDS version too. So if at any time you want any of you to say, uh, here's where it is here, I can tell you what it is there. No. Thank you. I think it's important to remember that, that Thomas Jefferson, just like the other members of the committee, were, were running a gauntlet of consensus with the colonies to try to find a path that they would all agree on enough to, to be signatories of the, the declaration. These guys were under all kinds of pressure from the crown, uh, basically telling them, you know, you either 
you either cave into the crown or we're going to hang you all. You know, I mean, it, it, it was a, it was really kind of a, a difficult situation for the people who did break away to ignore the the tremendous power that the king had. And so I think that, that you have to keep in mind when he's wording things, uh, there were a lot of people who had already established a certain way of life and they had to feel like that life was something they were defending and they weren't going to give it up just to, to, to please some guys that were trying to break away from the king. And that's exactly right. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, I believe that it was the crown that in some respects was requiring uh, slaves to be sold in the new countries, in the new colonies. Slavery has been around a long, long time, and it probably still is. I'm sure it is. I think it's really interesting, uh, kind of, since since we're centering on Jefferson quite a bit here, I think it's interesting that truth is something that you can live out of step with. So, I mean, if we think about truth as like just purely information, I think that it almost doesn't feel right to say you can live out of step with it because you can be ignorant of information and no one really says you're quite out of step with it. But then there's also things like, um, there are certain truths you can't be out of step with. For instance, I have one door that leads out of the room that I'm in right now. And I mean, no matter how hard I try, I can't get past that truth. You know, I'm not going to find my way through a wall. I have to go through that door. But um, I think it's fascinating that uh, that truth is something that we can we can even believe it and we can still act contrary to it in some way. I, I wonder if. Uh, if this is also related to something, Edward, you, you noted something in, in the Doctrine and Covenants that I found really interesting, which was um, it, it sort of underlined that truth is very closely tied up with God as like a person, that there is this sense in which interacting with God, uh, like one of us interpersonally act, interacting with God, almost constitutes that truth, that truth is, is almost tied up in the person that is God. Um, and, and maybe there's a little bit of theological discussion to have there, of course, but I, uh, I can't help but wonder if, if there's a, a connection there between like truth being tied up to the person that is God and truth as something we can live out of step with in the same way that we can know and even love another person and still also treat them in terrible ways or alienate ourselves from them and so on and so on. Well, I think in section uh, 90, uh, the Lord told, told us that. He says, I give unto you these things that you may understand and know, one, how to worship, and two, know what you worship. Um, That's 93 on LDS version. Yeah. Um, he says that uh, you may come unto the Father in my name in due time. You'll receive of his fullness. If you keep my commandments, you shall receive of his fullness. So that, that's the promise. You want to know the truth? Well, you're going to have to keep his commandments. Uh, but until you do, until you receive the fullness, you will not really understand uh, what you were worshiping. I, I recall when I had some rather rough times in the church uh, some time ago. I felt like I really didn't know who I was, what I was worshiping, and I had to, I had to, to figure that out. Otherwise, you're just on uh, thin ice, shaky ground. You got to have a, got to have a, a firm footing to know what, what it is you worship. So I agree with what you said. Beautifully put. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I wouldn't mind jumping in. Um, um, don't know if I can express myself exactly, but I know the opposite of truth is a lie. We know that the Lord God does not lie. He cannot lie. And I know that these men that were a part of this writing pledged their lives and their fortunes and their honor 
to this concept of truth. And I, as I understand, Jefferson originally had wrote it that these truths were to be sacred and undeniable, but it was changed to self-evident. And um, if you take just alone that a truth that all men are created equal, well, we know for a fact that we as people are not exactly equal uh, physically and uh, in our talents, abilities, in many ways, we're not equal. But I don't think Jefferson was talking about uh, any of this. I think he was talking about spiritually. And I happen to very much agree with the lady that shared that this man was led, whether he realized or not, as were others, to be led by the spirit of God, because truth is spirit to me. And, and maybe some others believe in other elements of truth, but I think the most important truth is the truth through the spirit of truth. And that is what I think that God was trying to help to establish this country on was a basis of truths that were undeniable, didn't need to be proved. And those things in themselves would unite people. If we all have a truth that we believe in God, that keeps us from separating. If we have a truth that we love our neighbor as ourselves, then that's a truth. If we all agree upon it, they are at a spiritual level that will unite us. And then all things would fall to me in line. I think those things were presented. I think that he, he reached out of uh, coming from, you know, the backgrounds of, of being under rule of kings and uh, governments, and he was trying to possibly, through God, set up and establish a government that based it at a spiritual level that would would define those specific truths uh, about our life and about our liberty and about our happiness. Because the natural man is all each one of us is seeking some way to find a truth about our happiness, our, our individual happiness, but it want, it needs to go further than that, not because if our personal being is, has pers pursuit of and finds truth and happiness and liberty, then this is something that we would, if we united and did it together, I think that's what they were going for. I personally believe in the, the Zionic uh, concept that one day we will have uh, a Zionic community and we will live by truth because he says in the end that truth will sweep the earth and then that's at what point and the word Zion means to be one and so that's that's just briefly how I feel about it because I could I could certainly share more feelings hope that um, makes sense to someone Oh, my husband wants yeah. to say something. Also, uh, the, the comment was made that Jefferson and Washington and, and all the other delegates were inspired by God and, and he blessed them. In our Doctrine and Covenants, section 83, 7C, in the RLDS version, um, it says that the spirit giveth light to every man that cometh into the world and the spirit enlighteneth every man through the world that hearken to the voice of the spirit. This indeed is, I believe, what Jefferson was saying, uh, however many times it was rewritten and edited, to say that that is the equality that he's talking about. All of us are given this gift from our creator. Everyone. Doesn't matter when you were born, where you were born, what continent, or any other demographic you want to you wanna pick and choose from. The spirit of God is given, Christ given to everyone that comes into the world because he's our creator. So in that context, in that sense, we are all equal. Now, what we do with it from there on, whatever our life's opportunities may be, sure, those are factors, absolutely. But the fact of the matter is, when we come to this world, there is a portion of the spirit of Christ that's given to every man, woman, and child that comes into this world. Also to uh, Mr. Fonts, and I hope I didn't mispronounce your name, there's another book sure. by, uh, by uh, Skousen called The 5,000-Year Leap. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I it's am very familiar much. With that. What's that? I am familiar with that. Okay, so that speaks very much to your point about uh, what Moses set up, the theocracy, and how much that was patterned after by Jefferson and Adams and 
all the rest of the, uh, the constituents there to try to craft our constitution, bill of rights, and, and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, there, there is a sense of equality that they were shooting for in a spiritual sense, because if it has to start spiritually first, otherwise it can never be temporally or physically. Well, of course, the, the book of Genesis tells us that there were two creations. The first one yes. was a spiritual one. Yes, That's right. absolutely. That's right. And, and, and uh, Nancy, uh, in, in this part of the section 90 that I read earlier about truth being the knowledge of things as they are, were, and will be. Yes. It, it picks up right from there and says, and whatsoever is more or less than this mm -hmm. is the spirit of that wicked one yes. who, was a, who was a liar from the beginning. Yeah. Yes. The I... spirit of, he says, the spirit of truth is of God and I am the spirit of truth. Amen. Yeah. Now, there's some place and I, I can't put my I can't place exactly where, but I remember reading somewhere about um, the church was uh, was told that uh, you should you should embrace the constitutional law of the country, but what is more or less than the constitutional law is not of God, which is almost the same thing as saying. Uh, Whatever is more or less than this is the spirit of the wicked one. Does anybody know where that idea comes from? That's section 112. Yeah. 112? The LDS edition. Do you, have, the, do you have the exact language? Big pardon? Do you have the exact language? What it said? Se section 112. I don't uh, have it in hand at the moment, but can get it. Uh, <laughs> it's right here. It's right here. Section 112 says, we believe that governments were instituted of God for the benefit of man, that he holds men accountable for their acts in relation to them, either in making laws or administering them for the good and safety of society. We believe that no government can exist in peace except such laws are framed and held inviolate as will secure to each individual the free exercise of conscience, the right and control of property, and protection of life. It goes on to talk about civil officers, magistrates, and a few other things in section 112 of our Doctrine and Covenants. Four says, we believe that religion is the institute of God and that men are amenable to him and to him only for the exercise of it. So it very much speaks to this point and topic about governments, uh, God is in the business of, of governing men and women and, and, and the nations, and he's, they, he seeks to do it in a way which is fair and just for all people. The fact, I would like yeah, to suggest. The fact that we haven't got there yet is a different conversation. I would well, like I to suggest. Like, as a section 100. Law, I, I always like the fact that when they ask Jesus what's the greatest law, the greatest commandment, and he, he gave it to him. Love the Lord thy God with all their heart, might, mind, and strength. And then he said, the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, upon those two principles hangs all the law. And the prophets. If you, if you go in any law library and say, you know, where's the law? You will be looking at rows and rows and rows of statutes and and, and uh, regulations that uh, it's just nobody knows the law you can't you go into court and you argue to a judge he doesn't know the law he expects you to cite it to him and then everybody argues about it but they they're not in agreement on the principle it's amazing how simple god's statutory basis is compared That's what, to blair has something he would like to add Yes, that uh, section 112 was not a revelation. It was adopted in 1835 when the, by the uh, conference when they accepted the um, uh, first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. But it was not a revelation. It, it was a, a uh, position taken by the conferred conference in 
accepting the doctrine and covenants. Right. Uh, by the way, when you look at the life of Joseph Smith as prophet, he received the vast majority of his revelations within a very short period of time. Why did you move mute that out? I'm sorry. David. Okay. Um, David DeBarth has his hand up. Yeah, way back when I wanted to respond to Nathan's uh, comments about truth on the door, which intrigued me no end. Because uh, from the scientific training, the scientific background, the scientist would say, if that door is closed, there's a 99.99% .99 chance you can't walk through it. And yet, there is a record of Jesus appearing in a locked room. <laughs> so we end up with that 001% out there to say, there may yet be more truth that modifies the truth that I currently know. Can you put it down? Stephen, you had your hand up. Let Nathan respond first. Oh. I was just, just going to say that was well put. Um, I, I'm reminded of, a, I'm, I'm a dirty postmodernist. I'll, I'll kind of allow that. I know there's extremes, and I don't like those extremes, but I like French philosophy. And Jacques Derrida is one of my favorite philosophers. And he, uh, he would draw on his Jewish heritage to explain something very similar, which is, you know, at most, we can only ever be 99.9% .9 sure of something because there's always that little thing that's going to come in and ruin what we think we already know. So one of the, the analogies he would use was the Seder meal for Passover, where people will intentionally leave an empty seat for Elijah in the anticipation of Elijah coming to that meal. There's, um, and he, Derrida draws this analogy to how we should sort of formulate our ideologies and our understandings of the world in a similar way. We should leave this proverbially empty seat always open for you know, what will inevitably come in and change the uh, metaphorical meal, as it were. So I, I just thought that was really well put. So thank you for sharing that. So I'm so glad that Nathan, I invited you to this uh, meeting because I knew you would be a great contributor. So here I have a copy of the 5,000 year leap, um, part of my collection. Now this is, this, this is the most interesting thing about all of this conversation is I'm an evangelical and the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants do not function as scripture to me. And a lot of you are using the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants to make your truth claims. And so it's just kind of an interesting thing where like, well, I'm quoting from DNC, I'm quoting from the Book of Mormon, and this is the truth. Now I'm an outsider. Now, first of all, I don't, I love the Book of Mormon. I love the restoration and everything that it represents. So, but it's just a fascinating thing where you're making truth claims based on something that most like my evangelical friends would say, well, there's no truth there. There's no uh, basis to anything there. Um, and so now we have a situation where, you know, I, like I'm the Zod duck, I'm having this conversation with you guys, when you would make these, com these statements from your scriptures, it'd be like, as an outsider, that doesn't really apply to me, because I, I wouldn't be using those to make my arguments, just, just a thought. David DeBarth? Yes. Your hand is up. Did you have a question? My hand is still up. I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought I turned it off. Okay, it's put off. It Oops. Put it down to you. Okay, it's off now. I'm sorry. I apologize. It's back on. I'm it's down ready. now. Uh, Blair Bryant, go ahead. May I respond to Stephen? <laughs> Stephen, you're the one that came up with the truth is a capital T. I agree, there is truth that's a capital T. Sometimes we don't recognize the truth with a capital T, even though it's still the truth. We haven't got there yet. We have a journey. So from my perspective, when I quote the Doctrine and Covenants and the Book of Mormon, that's a part of my truth with a capital T. And I welcome you on a journey to listen to it. 
So I'm, I'm not quite there yet, you see. You know, of course, <laughs> yeah. you, I'm on this journey and eventually, perhaps, right? Yeah. All right. I saw where Aspie had his hand up, but I'm not seeing Aspie. Are you still there? Yes, uh, I'm here. Oh, Do you right. hear me? Yep, yep, go ahead. Okay. I already posted some questions in the chats, and I do not have any responses. The main uh, question in the chats is about the conversion table between the LDS version and the COF version of the numbering of the Book of Truth, of the Doctrine and Covenant. So if anybody could respond to what I put in the chats, that would be a great thing. Blair, that's a book that you have, is it not, that shows the conversion of the LDS? Well, the particular book that I've got right here is a 1952 edition of an LDS Doctrine and Covenant that when I was a guide at Nauvoo, I went through and compared all the way down the line. This was back in the old days now. I'm 89, so this is, goes way back a long time. But uh, I do have a book that compares the um, the books, uh, and it's a very good one. It's written by Richard Howard. It's rest, called Restoration Scriptures that compares this. Now, if I might respond to uh, SP uh, about the um, LDS and, and Community of Christ versions, uh, I can talk with you like that separately if you want, Aspie. Uh, you've got my email address, I believe. Uh, and you can go to that book by Richard Howard and get a lot of information about how this was done. But basically, the both churches took the version uh, of the Doctrine and Covenants that was in the 1840 period and used that during the 1800s. But then Orson Pratt, back in 1876 or so, made a change in the Doctrine and Covenants that did all sorts of things. He removed some sections that were not in the, eight, that were in the 1835 section. He added sections that were not in the 1835 sections and he renumbered them. And in the Community of Christ version, we started with the old 1840 area and then we then in 1860 started receiving revelations that were added on to that so we had two set different sets of books now there are a whole bunch uh, something like 37 revelations that are the same starting with um, um well i'm something like 14, and goes up through section 76 that are the same. Paragraph, not by paragraph, no. Number by number of the sections. Now the LDS version renumbered all the sections. In the community of Christ, it was my mother that made a recommendation to the first presidency that we break these big, big paragraphs up. And so they were broken up A, B, C, D, sort for easy finding, easy reference. And that was done back in the eight, uh, 1960s that we went into that uh, section 76, paragraph five deals with the celestial glory, for example, and you got five going down through, oh, I don't know, five A, B, C, through probably M or N, something like that. Those two different versions, however, for those common 
sections of the Doctrine and Covenants are basically the same, just broken up into different verses. Um, Nathan has added something in the chat box for those of you who want it. It's a link for um, uh, corresponding the section numbers. Aspie, that was specifically addressed to you, but anybody might benefit from it. Uh, Roger Gilbert has his hand up. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, I just wanted to add to Stephen's point that uh, not only is this a very restorationized discussion of truth, um, but it's also a very American one. If you think about it, we're talking a lot about the Constitution documents and those kinds of things, which were we having this discussion in Australia or Japan or somewhere else in the world, we would not have started there nor ended there with that type of discussion. So I think it goes back to that original point that, you know, maybe not that there are different truths for me and someone around the world with a different culture, but maybe, you know, maybe I know some truths and I'm not correct on a few things. And maybe someone of a whole different culture and background and even religion has truths that they know that I don't either. And we both have some partialities of correctness, um, but we both have a ways to go. If I'd I like to intrude if I may. If I uh, if I finally got my electrical pieces put back together again so that I can be, get back on, I really appreciate the bits and pieces I've been able to hear. I do want to point out that uh, if we can get the slides ready that are available on the on the uh, on the later presentation, that uh, they do address a Hindu and a Zoroastrian and an Aboriginal vantage point as well to uh, try to bring other uh, understandings of, of truth together. But I wanted to conclude uh, my consideration of that Thomas Jefferson statement with something that I think is convergent with what several of you have said. But uh, 1967, Frank Fry and I were hitchhiking to Mexico City to go to school. And we ended up walking through the city of Monterrey, which was the industrial capital of Northern Mexico. And on the street corner, on the street corner, we saw a gentleman sitting with, or not sitting, he was on a board with, with four casters under the corners. He had no arms, he had no legs. He had hooks from his shoulder, shoulders that allowed him to, to reach out and drag himself along at about six inches at a time. And he could pick his chin up off the ground about six inches. He had newspapers and magazines there on the dirty street corner with, with all of the dust and so forth swirling around. He had a cup to uh, allow people to put their contribution in before they took off with the newspaper or the magazine. I stopped and stared. Here was an Iowa farm boy who had never seen anything quite like this before. And I remember that the questions coursed through my thinking, how can such a creature as this have been created in the image of God? What does it mean that all men are created equal? I stood there and I stared at him. I'm sure he'd been stared at many times before. And he looked up at me. He met my gaze square on and he smiled. And I have taken that as an answer. I apologize, still apologize. I did not put any coins, any, any money in his cup. I did not even give him a verbal greeting. Yet that gentleman profoundly influenced my life by suggesting that even though he didn't have arms and legs, he, as a human being, was able to share and bless my life. And that made him equal as a human being to me. We are all entitled to our own humanity. And it should be self-evident that each of us is entitled only to be one human. That's a beautiful experience, Paul. Thank you for that. Sorry, I didn't get to participate in all the other discussions. I certainly wanted to be able to get into the, uh, uh, I wanted to show the slides and get in the pictures of, of the, uh, of Ahura Mazda, the Zoroastrian deity from 700 BC, who 
was the first real monotheist and appears probably the background monotheist for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And Ahura Mazda um, made, it, made it quite clear that the only unforgivable sin was to lie. Because if you lie, you're attempting to pass on to someone else a fabrication that will not withstand the fires of hell. And so they would put people through fire tests. And we have that in Isaiah, where Isaiah uh, set, uh, was a matter was a person of unclean lips, and the seraphim came from the altar with a coal to place upon his lips and pur purify and purge him. And that process is still being done by Zoroastrians, young people who want to be initiated, will go through that test, and they'll the uh, priest will bring the uh, the the ember from the altar and place it on their tongue. And if they cry, if they scream, then clearly they're burning out some of that, some of the lies. But if they are truth tellers, then it will not, it will not injure them. And so it's a very interesting test. My wife comes from, from the Polynesian islands where they do the fire test of people walking across the pit. And the fire pit um, is something that gets up to, well, Eddie Butterworth said about 1200 degrees. And walk across that, and you sort of expect to get bit burned and scorched, and many people do. But if you appropriately follow the lead of the of the uh, priest, then you presumably will walk across and not be injured. Butterworth described it as as having a swirl of heat, and it felt like his eyes were melting out. But uh, but the swirl of heat was not something he was particularly sensitive about uh, from his waist down. Well, the understanding of truth from other cultures, um, more often than not, is based upon that big truth that Nathan was talking about. And when we get into our little truths, I find it very curious that, that we generally uh, like the sunrise and sunset. And yet for 400 years, we've known that's not true. Well, in my slides, I had some uh, several ref references to the things the Book of Mormon says. One of the things I was interested to, to point out is that that there are 40 references in the Book of Mormon to it, the truth of its own words. And so that helps to explain why people who read the Book of Mormon believe it often testify that, uh, that I know the Book of Mormon to be true because I've read it and the words have told me that. On the other hand, there is a very clear emphasis in the Book of Mormon that uh, that uh, the truth of the of the divine is all of reality, and it, it just amazes me to, to see. Well, it was forty two, I think, references to truth alone, and another forty that are talking about what it is to be true, and so there's a lot of good references in the Book of Mormon. I had a bunch of them cited on the on the PowerPoint, but because of my computer failures, I'm sorry that I'm not able to get that out for you tonight. Aspie, in response to your question about the slides being made available, they're going to do their best once Paul's computer comes up, they're gonna to try to put it with the presentation. Mm -hmm. so Paul, when do you want me to speak? Go ahead, Bill. All right. I wrote my thing out because I, I, I write better than I uh, speak, exper uh, 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 speak. So I have a question. What exactly makes the Book of Mormon, quote, true, unquote? I've heard that uh, in our discussions. Was it because other people or someone you admire and respect said it was true? Was it because of a good feeling you have when you read it and you associate that feeling with the presence of the Holy Spirit? Was it because it seems to be true historically? Was it because you venerate Joseph Smith 
and anything he said you believe is fact. Even when there are stories circulating that he experimented in different ways to get God to speak to him. A question to consider, how did God tell Joseph Smith the translation of the Book of Mormon? Don't get me wrong with these questions. The sound, they sound very skeptical on my part. No, one of my favorite stories is Ammon and his brothers going to the Lamanites and converting many, even under dangerous circumstances. But I'm a retired writing teacher and have had to dis dis uh, discriminate whether a student plagiarized or not. Therefore, I have a discerning and questioning mind. And related to these questions is how authentic was the translation from the Egyptian to English? How was it done? And how did God help Joseph do it? How much was from Joseph's imagination? Here's my thinking still related to the question, how is the Book of Mormon true? Did God actually tell Joseph the exact English? I have heard stories from individuals that God spoke to them in English, and I'm not going to, going to say how God communicates to God's creation. God does what God does. I myself have had several, at least one, at, at least one degree to another of God speaking to me. As God's creation from his love, God is very interested in my physical, mental, and spiritual development. God wants me to be the best I can be. So God leaves much up to me to figure things out. How God speaks to me is God leaves intelligence planted on my mind. The English word intelligence has two meanings. One is one's ability to think, the other is, quote, heavenly knowledge, unquote, a rough translation from the Chinese, Zhihui. I'm referring to the latter. My task is to place that intelligence implanted in my mind into my native language, English, to extract the full meaning what God is telling me. However, I am well aware that English is limiting the full meaning of what God is telling me. God is a mighty big God. What I'm, what I'm getting at is wondering, did Joseph Smith get everything right? And did God speak to Joseph exactly in English? Or did God plant God's intelligence in Joseph's mind? In other words, how accurate is the translation? Having been taught some Mandarin Chinese, I know you cannot translate word by word. I must work hard to get as close as I can in English to get the Chinese meaning as close as I can in English. And to know the Chinese meaning, I must understand the culture in which the words are embedded. For example, the Chinese word hanguai Literally, they mean that a person, a behavior is very good. But knowing the influence of Confucius teaching in Chinese history, I must remember that a person is good in relation to Confucius thinking and teaching. Therefore, my question, was the Book of Mormon translation given to Joseph word by word by God? Or did Joseph have to use some of his faculties to choose the right words? And did God teach him the cultural influences on the translation? So what again I'm getting at is the question, how accurate, how true is the English words in the Book of Mormon? Thank you, Joseph. What is the truth? How is the Book of Mormon true?
Mm, everybody's so quiet. Can I make a response to that? In time? Uh, I sure, oh, I sure want to take a crack at that. Okay, you got lots of people. Was Nathan, did you want to respond? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> well, you're fine. I, I thought that was, first and foremost, I thought that was incredibly beautiful. I, thought, I think that was incredibly well expressed. Um, I, I don't have a background in Mandarin, but I do in Latin. Um, as much as like, I, I took four years of Latin in high school. So as much of a background as that can be. And I, I resonate very much with this idea that that, that it's even in Latin that's so cognate to English, it's so incredibly difficult to express a thought in English from Latin sometimes. I, um, I think, for instance, of Joseph Smith's history of um, making uh, corrections, we could say, or even just uh, alterations to the text of the Book of Mormon from one edition to the next. And I mean that in a very neutral sense, the idea of, you know, expanding um, Nephi's concept of the, of the, the Lamb of God being the, the Son of God and, and so forth, uh, or, or the ways in which his understanding seemed to expand from the Book of Commandments to the Doctrine and Covenants. I, uh, I'm reminded of this uh, story of, of uh, Thomas Aquinas, who's a, a saint and a scholar in Catholicism. He, it, it's, it's funny, too, because it's, it's, it's a story I've never really heard, but it's such a beautiful one from the end of his life. Um, there was this moment when Thomas Aquinas was almost about to finish his like his crowning achievement, the Summa Theologica, um, which was like essentially the most systematic way he could present what he what he felt was the gospel, uh, like in every possible detail. And he was celebrating the mass uh, this one day and he had this moment and he never articulated what that moment was, but he never wrote again. He scrapped the Summa entirely. And he didn't write anything further. And uh, one of his friends asked him, why, why, uh, why did you scrap everything? Why didn't you write further? And he, uh, he told his friend that everything that he had written up until then and everything he felt like he could write from then on just felt like so much straw. And uh, I, I think that that's an incredible experience to have, that you have such a direct encounter with God, presumably, that, that it wipes out everything you think you know. And that, that was something I, I was thinking about, Bill, as you were, you were sharing the, the, the concept of how true the English text of the Book of Mormon would be, which is, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's Joseph's approximation of what he was trying to express. I, I think of this, uh, I'll just add this and I'll, I'll, I'll finish myself, you know, uh, but uh, I, I understand that Brigham Young, for instance, is not necessarily an authoritative figure in um, for everyone here at present, I acknowledge that. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to present him as such. I mean to present this as an idea to play with. There's a quote from Young that I like a lot. Um, I think shortly after Joseph Smith was assassinated, he said this, that uh, he expressed the opinion that if Joseph Smith had, had dictated the Book of Mormon in the Nauvoo era, that it would have been a substantially different text than it was uh, had he, you know, as he did uh, when he dictated it in 28 and 29. Um, and I, I think about that quite a bit, that when, when we're dictating even scripture, we're still left to approximate a truth that we have to, I think, experience directly in order to really know it. Thank, Thank you. you, Nathan. Thank you so much, Nathan. Excellent. I'd like to take an opposite position. I, I, first of all, Joseph, in 28 and 29, um, he could not read what was on the plates. There was an unknown language to him. And according to his wife, Emma, English was almost an unknown language to him. She said he could barely uh, scrap together uh, the word for a couple of sentences. So when we say, Joseph processed this book through his own faculty. He had to go from a language he didn't know to another language that he really didn't write. But there's a third problem. Uh, the scholars at uh, BYU have discovered that the King James Version citations that are in the Book of Mormon are not from the King James Version. And a lot of people assume that, well, he got the drift and so he copied it. Not so. Turns out that the text of the uh, uh, 
so-called King James Version parts of particularly First and Second Nephi is a fifth century English version that is, was a dead language before Joseph worked on the book. So he had to work with three unknown languages and we're suggesting that he processed it through. Uh, that God gave him some, some uplift Ooh, and way. help and that he figured right. out what words to that use. Way to to where. Um, back in the early 80s, I, I uh, using the computer, I, I typed the entire Book of Mormon and began working on reformatting it into a more Hebrew poetry style. And it took me five years. Uh, Joseph did this in a relatively short period of time. And Emma said, he never asked. It, I know in a courtroom, uh, uh, a lawyer will say to the judge, can I have the last question read back? Joseph never asked, according to Emma, to have read where he stopped. He started in. He also um, would spell out a word that he didn't know how, he, he didn't know what it was. He couldn't pronounce it, so he would spell it out. How did he spell it out if he didn't see the image? Now we know that he had some physical um, things that he used. We know that he had the human thumb, he had the breastplate, and he also would put uh, a hat or something over his face so he had a dark, had a darkness where he could see. Now consider that we have our computers now that will display the written language in one language from another. And all you have to this do- This meeting is, is being recorded. What? Um, I, I think that Joseph was given the power to read what was placed before his eyes because uh, he did not have the capacity in any of those three languages, English, the Reformed Egyptian, or the dead language of the fifth century uh, English. It, 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 it would be ridiculous to ask him to process it through his mind and experiences. Um, he said it was done through the gift and power of God. I think we have to recognize that. And one of the things that uh, I wanted to say about the gentleman who said that I was quoting from uh, Doctrine and Covenants and so forth, listen, I accept Joseph Smith as, the, as one of the greatest prophets ever. He produced more scripture. You, know, you ever look at how big the book of uh, Isaiah is? It's pretty small. What did Joseph Smith produce? Well, he, had, he worked on the inspired version produced the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and there were probably other things that he wrote that, well, uh, I, I know that uh, what they wrote when they were writing the first preface to the Doctrine and Covenants is not included anymore. An enormous amount of uh, scripture were generated by this prophet. And I have to tell you, when I sat there and worked on that pro project for five years uh, using a computer and having many years of uh, education, which Joseph didn't have, I, I was overwhelmed at what he was able to accomplish. And I think that, yes, we have, um, Joseph said it's the most accurately uh, uh, written book that we have. Doesn't mean it's perfect, and even the book itself says if there are errors, there are errors of men. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, of uh, facts that you've got to take into account, and uh, we don't have time to do that this evening. But there is a whole raft of things that that would be almost impossible to accomplish in the period of time he had to do the book. The other thing is important. 
that book was written and published before the original Latter-day Saints of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ was formed. It was already, it was, I'll tell you, it was God's gift to the world. It was not a gift to the church. The book was published before April uh, 30th, 1830, April 5th, 1830. And the Lord told him what date, at what date the church had to be organized. He gave him the exact date. And the book was done before then. It was done on a timetable that was not his. He had to work with three languages he didn't know. And nobody, no one could do it. No one could do it unless they had divine providence working with them. That's all I have to say about that. Blair, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I don't, except that. I believe, I cannot tell you anything more specific but I feel a power, a power I cannot deny. Jesus is the Christ. And that book tells us about that. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Nancy? Yes, I want to thank uh, Brother Fonts for uh, his statements. And I, I, I believe this to be very true. I, I'm, I'm worried that we get too far uh, of looking for truth to get too far away uh, than, than the spirit. And that being of the Lord, I, when when the Lord stood before Pilate, Pilate asked him about truth, and he said it, that it truth is with with those who I forget exactly. It's um, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And so, in reference to going to the Scripture, to me, I accept the Scriptures as the Word of God, and I've tried to share testimony that I have gone to the Lord myself and I've asked questions and I have received those answers. And I think that's where we're failing as a people is that we're not going to him and asking him for those answers. And our, our gospel is based on that. It's based on the truth that Joseph Smith went and asked according to the promise from the scriptures that anyone who's seeking for truth and seeking for answers can ask of God. And so I do believe that. And it, but I just hate to get away from the spirit of this. This really, really concerns me because that to me as, as raising my own children and trying to lead them to how do you find truth? It's you go to the Lord and you go to his word. And I just want to stand by that. I too have studied language. I, in college, I studied three languages and our whole family, we had my mom and brother were interpreters for the church. And um, so I, I understand about interpreting languages, but I also was raised with a, a patriarch that was like a grandfather to me. And I used to travel with him and he used to talk to me about hearing the words of God and how that process, uh, he was involved in that. And so I I put a lot of trust in what Joseph Smith was doing, was listening to and seeing the word, words of God himself as, as, uh, as, my, as this, this patriarch shared with me, that it's not a, just a matter of just interpreting language to language, but that God helped interject. I could watch this brother Alma Johnson, I could watch his face and I could see him as, and he would tell me, I, as the words would come from God, and he would search for the um, the um, English words to put with it. And so I, I personally believe that Joseph Smith was led by the Lord in this. I also believe that Thomas Jefferson was led by the spirit of the Lord to help. And these men that were willing to give their lives for truth. And 
we will only find that truth through God and through his spirit, as all I'll, I'll say. Thank you, Nancy. I'd like to follow up on what she said on just one thing. You, you know, uh, someone mentioned earlier that uh, that they had a connection with someone who uh, asked the first presidency to uh, break, break the uh, Doctrine and Covenants down into verses. Um, for the last 20 years, I've been working on putting them back into their Hebraic forms. Uh, if you go to the Old Testament and you look at the book of Isaiah, the modern, the modern uh, Hebraic scholars have put it into a form of poetry that is beyond anything. I mean, if you put it in English paragraphs, first of all, you can't write. You can't write Hebrew in English paragraphs. It doesn't work. You take the very first page of the Book of Mormon, and I challenge you, I dare you to try to write that in English. It's not possible. I know I spent weeks trying to do it until I finally saw what the scholars had done with the book of Isaiah, with the Old Testament, and they put it into a form of poetry that flows like a mighty river downhill. And I want to tell you, when I suddenly, after I finished the Book of Mormon and doing that, uh, which is now published as the Restored Covenant Edition, uh, I started doing the Doctrine and Covenants. And at first, my, uh, my uh, effort was to find chiasms in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants. But I found that the Doctrine and Covenants is the most beautiful poetry. And uh, I, sent, I sent to Paul a poetic format of this section 90. Some of these paragraphs are very long. The, the, the verses, the, if you compare the LDS and the RLDS version, uh, the versification just the, they break up the flow of the Hebrew poetry. And you say, well, but this is English, it isn't Hebrew poetry. I'm telling you that the language of God shines through so brightly, it doesn't make any difference what language you write it in. It's going to have the, to the trained ear, to the trained eye, you can see the development of the ideas and the poetic structure there, they can, you cannot replicate it by using the, the formats of these languages. It's, that's one, that's one, that's my testimony about what Joseph Smith did. He, it was impossible for him to write the Doctrine and Covenants in poetry, but you go look at it. It's astounding. Thank you, Ed. Thank Cynthia. You. Cynthia, I just want to say, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate what our brother just has shared with us. Thank you so much. Sorry to interrupt. Cynthia, go ahead, please. I have, I don't have the education that you guys are talking about. Uh, I do when uh, he was talking about how do you know this truth? It seems to me like truth is linked to the word faith, that whatever you hold up as a standard or and that standard has to be something that you have faith in. And when you compare them or whatever, it seems like faith goes in with it uh, that like trusting that feeling in your heart or whatever that tells you that this is true. I had that feeling as a fairly young child reading the Book of Mormon that this, it, it made my heart beat extra fast. I had a belief in it and a faith, I guess you'd say as a child. I, I find that I'm feeling that, that I think, yet I have family and stuff that say, you can't count on feelings. You have to count on proof and evidences. And you all have offered a lot of proof tonight but it seems to me that you have to have faith 
in some of those standards as being true before you can say something is true. And so I'm not sure how to, to have truth without having faith in something. Thanks, Cynthia. Bill Gunlock, you had something? Oh yeah, I just wanted to comment what Ed said. Yeah, I, first I wanna ask a question. Ed Fonts, uh, uh, did you go to Graceland? I did. Weren't you my, weren't you in my class of 58 to 62? No, it was probably my brothers. No, okay. I was there, I was there at 57 and 58. No, oh, okay. Anyway, I, I want to comment that I, I've taught the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, and I discovered the lyrical parts in it. They're amazing. Yes. yes. Uh, and I, I've marked those parts in the DNC uh, that are very lyrical. Absolutely. Section 76, is that the uh, the three glories? That is the most beautiful example of uh, parallelisms in Hebrew style poetry that we have in the Doctrine and Covenants. Hmm. I'll share it with you sometime if you'd like. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> If I could uh, add something too, I, I think um, Cynthia raised a really interesting point when she started talking about faith. Um, I, I was kind of hoping to expand on that a little bit because uh, when, I, when I think of the term faith, I actually think of it as a very different term from the term belief or uh, what we might mean as like a propositional truth um, or a claim. I, I think that faith uh, is a really interesting thing. When Paul uses the term in the New Testament, he uses this Greek term pistis which you can actually find on uh, the outside of banks in Greece to this day, it means um, like a trust or uh, like a fidelity. I think there's, a, there's this sense in which faith, as opposed to beliefs or like uh, statements of, of what we think is so, I think faith is almost like a letting go. Faith is um, a willingness to allow ourselves to be vulnerable to whatever the truth might actually be, as opposed to... Um, insisting upon what we think it already is it's it's um it's allowing in a manner of speaking i suppose it's it's entrusting oneself to god wherever god may take one um and i think that that's a that's an important concept i think for what we've been talking about tonight about what what constitutes truth because i think uh, going back to an earlier point we we've discussed already of course about the difference between capital t truth and our best understanding of it or even the, the story of Thomas Aquinas that I, I shared earlier, I think that there are these moments of faith where rather than insisting upon what we, uh, what we may have a conviction about right this second, I feel like faith is a willingness to trust whatever the truth may be. Thank you, uh, Nate. That's, you have expressed exactly what I was trying to get to is it something bigger than a belief? Because if you have, if you think something is a truth and you act upon that truth, where no matter where it takes you, there, there is that element of faith that, as you said, you don't know where it's going to lead and it might totally take you totally away from anything that you ever dreamed of. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that point, Cynthia. I thought it was a really well-made point. Nathan, thank you for being a part of us. No problem. Thank your, you for having me. Your input has been marvelous. And yeah. let me thank Deb for, uh, for coordinating. I'm sorry I got cut out tonight because of computer problems, but the little bits that I, and pieces I've gotten to hear really have impressed me. And I, I was anticipating that, that if we had enough faith, they would get me there. And it appears to me that uh, by having enough, enough faith, you guys have gotten there without me being able to participate very much. And that's remarkable. I mean, I, from a, <laughs> from a teacher's perspective to, to, open the forum for a class and then have the students 
uh, handle that class and just take it all the way through is a delightful result. I would like yet to be able to get some of the information in that I uh, had, had prepared and we'll still work that out. But I am so pleased and impressed that we've had uh, people like Nathan show, show up and contribute so significantly and uh, Brother Fonts and, and uh, Brother Bryant. Uh, what, a, what a remarkable combination of people we've had contributing this evening on um, uh, the various uh, vantage points. And I think there's just an awful lot more that needs to be explored on this. I think it's a topic that we haven't done enough with. And so I, I am open to your advice as to how we can approach it uh, for further development. 